Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth Bats in Churches live event. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Rachel Arnold and I'm the Heritage Advisor for the Bats in Churches project. Bats in Churches is a partnership of heritage church and ecological organisations, all funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Our aim over five years is to help churches, their communities and their bats live more harmoniously together. Usually our work is very practical with lots of site visits, but at the moment that is slightly limited. So instead we are sharing some of our work with you online. Today I'm joined by three fantastic panellists to talk all about wall paintings. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Bats in Churches YouTube channel, hopefully by uh, sometime tomorrow afternoon. So don't panic if you miss anything, you can always catch up on that later. If you are having any technical problems with the connection to Zoom, try logging out and then back in again, and that should, that should sort, sort that problem out. In this session, the three panelists will each give a 10 minute talk about an aspect of uh, medieval church wall paintings. And then afterwards, you'll all be invited to ask them lots of questions. So far, our sessions have been very lively and we've had lots of questions. Um, so if we run out of time to answer them all, don't worry, we'll publish our responses later online, probably on Twitter, using the Bats in Churches uh, hashtag. Um, my colleague Diana, she is waiting in the wings in the Q&A section, so that's down below where you'll be able to click on that and, um, and ask your questions and she'll be responding to some of those directly. We'll also be able to ask some of them live and if you have access to Twitter or Facebook, you can also log in there. And, and ask the questions over there. After our second Bats in Churches live session um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about church buildings and why they are so important. And we had several comments and questions asking for more information about the project and about bats in churches in general. Um, and I'll, we'll touch on that a little bit today with the, with the wall paintings um, and one of the projects that we've been working with. But um, I'm very happy to say that there will be a dedicated session next week talking all about bats, how they use churches, um, the impact that they have on the church, the furnishings and people, and what the Bats in Churches project is doing. So please do tune into that. I know you had a lot of questions and um, it would be really nice to be able to answer them there for you. Anyway, back to today. My speakers are Roger Rosewell, who is the author of the authoritative guide on wall paintings and lots more books on stained glass as well as a researcher and lecturer um tobit curtis who is a specialist in wall paintings conserv conservation but is also a preventive conservator he's based in cambridge but works nationally and john morrison who is the chair of the fabric committee at arundel church in sussex who has led the way with a conservation project and their very own special wall paintings. So lots of you will have seen wall paintings in churches and it is obvious that they are very special, but it's not always obvious exactly what we are looking at. So today we're going to delve into that world and find out what they are, where to find them, how they survive, um, and what we can do to look after them um, and how they deteriorate. Then we'll all drill down into one particular church and its experience looking after their wall paintings. So first off, over to Roger. Um, and can you tell us a bit about how special wall paintings are? One moment. Sorry, I need to unmute you. Sorry about that. Are we fine? Well, so I'd just like to start by saying that wall paintings are extremely fragile and it's, uh, it's the, this project, the BATS project, deserves uh, our full support and encouragement in every way because BATS can do tremendous damage, not just to church brasses, woodwork, but especially to wall paintings as well, partly because of their very fragile state. So I uh, tremendous applause for the BATS project and the initiatives that they're taking. I thought I'd start by saying about something about wall paintings generally. Too often they are described as books for the illiterate, pictures for people who couldn't read, ways that uh, 
uneducated peasants can learn Bible stories and so on. There are lots of variations of that theme. This is very misleading. First of all, it's obviously not possible to learn complicated stories just by looking at pictures. Rather, wall paintings have to be seen in a rather broader context of some of a part of a multimedia experience that medieval churchgoers encountered with lots of visual imagery around them, sculpture, paintings, uh, stained glass, wall paintings, embroidered hangings, and so on. So there's a lot of imagery in churches, and that imagery works in different ways, in different times, for different people. And I'll give you, I'll just run through some of the main uh, groups of wall paintings which underline the point I'm trying to make. So one of the most popular forms is simple decoration. This obviously takes, this often takes the form of simple red lines being painted, uh, horizontal red lines being painted, which uh, with a few vertical stripes and which represents ashlar masonry. And therefore the church, uh, even the most humble church, can with a white plastered wall and the application of usually red paint, start to resemble something a building far more special. And that decoration can be enhanced and refined in a very variety of ways. So you end up making the church look special, important, a better building than perhaps it, it was. So that's one way. So we simply have decoration and there are versions of variations of that. And then we start to move on to wall paintings, particularly of images of Christ, which are these focuses of devotion. And they can be found above altars. As backdrops to altars above altars and you can go to somewhere like Capel in Kent Church's Conservation Trust Church where there's an annunciation on the east wall which obviously looks almost certainly was a part of an altar so the altar below and the full painting above and then if you prayed you would see this image of the crucified Christ or the, of the annunciation sorry and you, that would intensify your devotion. In addition to images such as those we have Bible stories very few from the Old Testament, usually in older churches, earlier churches, so maybe around 11, 1200, you would find Adam and Eve and the story of Genesis. But in the main, what we have is the Bible stories tend to be confined to stories really of Christ in the infancy of Christ and the passion of Christ. And that can be shown normally in such large sequences. And there are a number of those, and, and some of those were, are quite well known as at South Newington and so on. So you can have Bible stories and you can imagine the congregation being guided through those stories by a priest at times. And I say guided through because someone would have to explain what they were. They are prompts to memory, they are reminders so that when you want to think about the crucifixion of Christ, you can have in your mind's eye uh, have the sequence of events, and the villains and the heroes, and in that way, you, the, the story is embedded in your mind and you can, be, you can be summed up. But it can't be learned just by looking at them alone without some oral instruction. And then we have a number of paintings about saints and their lives, some of which again supporting full focuses of devotion, others complementing other activities within the church. And then we have, of course, the important group of paintings about death and judgment. Normally the doom above the chancel arch supported by paintings sometimes close by, or something called the three living and the three dead, where three living kings, wealthy and lush, meet three skeletons walking towards them. And not surprisingly, they ask, who are you? And the three skeletons reply, we were once, we, 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 we once, you, we were once like you, and one day you'll be like us reminding everybody that no matter how rich and well attired you are, that death is inevitable and judgment will follow. So we have, and then another painting in that category of the weighing of the souls, where again, the soul is judged as to whether they will make it or not. And then finally, we have a group of paintings, one of which John will talk about at Arundel, of the seven deadly sins and uh, the seven virtues, which highlight how you should live your life as a good Christian. And then we have a group of paintings which are loosely called moralities, I think, which talk about uh, don't break the Sabbath. So warnings to Sabbath breakers in which an image of Christ wearing only a loincloth is surrounded by agricultural implements and other day-to-day -to -day tools which injure him. 
pointing out that if you work on the Sabbath, you add to price injuries. We have another painting, most notably at Broughton in North Hampshire, um, Buff Buckinghamshire, North Hampshire, in the Milton Keynes area, which shows Christ's body literally being torn apart by people who are swearing by his foot or his arm. So it's a warning, do not blaspheme, because if you do, that adds to Christ's injuries. And then we have a uh, rather, today, we rather see this rather misogynic series of paintings of two women gossiping while the devil hovers above them, encouraging them, inciting them. And this warns against gossiping and this being disrespectful in church and probably a wider implications as well. So we have these groups of paintings and the are two that, that are quite varied. Uh, they have different meanings to different people at different times. And it's far too simplistic to talk about them simply as books for illiterate peasants. Overall, they add to our knowledge of medieval history and social conditions. They deserve and demand that we protect them. And this project today is an excellent way for that to, to, to take a form that's really needed to combat the damage done by bats. So I think that's enough from me. And uh, back to Rachel. Thank you, Roger. That was um, really interesting. Now I've got a few of your pictures that I was going that I'm going to share while I ask you a question. Um, one moment. I wonder if I can do this. Right, the question is going to be. Now there are lots of uh, wall paintings focused in certain areas, like you get a lot more in East Anglia, for example. Is there a reason for the um, for the geographical spread? Do you know? I think there are several reasons for this, possible, possible reasons for this. The, 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 first, the, the first reason is that it has to simply to do with the, the economic, act, economic activities within areas. So East Anglia was pretty poor in the 19th century, uh, ditto parts of Sussex and rural Oxfordshire, whereas the, Elsewhere in the country might be booming and the result of that is that where the country was enjoying economic success, old churches were sometimes demolished, as in say Preston in Lancashire and new churches built in their place. So we have the impact of the Industrial Revolution and 19th century wealth, uh, where it was rampant, old churches suffered significant makeovers, where it was less rampant, wall paintings and ancient plaster survived. Ancient plaster is the key here, because when you came to look at the church in the 19th century with three, 400 year old plaster on the walls, quite a few people thought it looked untidy, messy and dirty and needed to be replaced and therefore they stripped the walls. I think also it's a question of also where economic activity was in the Middle Ages. So somewhere like Lancashire was scarcely populated in the Middle Ages, whereas we know that Norwich East Anglia was, was one of the great wealth centres of England through the wool trade. And then we have sometimes materials matter a great deal. So in, I think in parts of the north, stonework was better than so rubble and clunch in parts of the south of England. So there are a number of reasons I think like that, which add up to why there seems to be disproportionate numbers. But even those explanations don't count for why there are so few relatively in Dorset. Um, so I, it, it just seems to be a bit of the luck of the draw, really, at the end of the day, what survives. Okay, thank you for that. I hadn't actually, yeah, I hadn't considered the um, building material side of things. So that's really, really fascinating. Okay, um, I'm going to pass over to Tobit Curtis now, um, who's going to talk more about um, the challenges that wall paintings face in, in context today. Right, let me see if I can do screen smooth. Good, can you see that? Yes. Fine. Just picking up on what Roger said, I completely agree with the, uh, the, the building materials in particular. If you look at what ch churches are built of in East Anglia, um, you don't particularly want to strip off the plaster to see a crumbling rubble wall and then you look at Oxfordshire and beautiful um, ashlar or, or finished stone and particularly in the 19th century the attraction of that clean um, internal architectural surface um, overweighed the, the saving the plaster again as Roger says if the plaster goes then the wall paintings go. 
Um, the conservation of wall paintings. Um, as Roger said, these were very extensive indeed. Every church, every domestic building would have been painted. Um, but the, the quality, the, um, the materials, the expertise with which paintings were, were executed varied um, enormously and therefore so did their conservation. Um, just very briefly to look at a, 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 a examples at two ends of the scale, tiny little church Hardham in um, East Sus West Sussex, um, wonderful 11th century um, painting, some of the finest uh, surviving. And then to leap to the other end of both scale and date, uh, Rochdale Town Hall, where we were the other day, this, this vast rebirth of, of 19th century painting. Um, and of course, everything um, in between. Um, conservation, we tend to think of in um, two phases. There's understanding and controlling deterioration, and there is conservation treatment and preventing damage happening in the future. You can't successfully do one without the other. You can't conserve and save paintings for, for the long term without understanding and controlling those underlying causes of damage. They tend to be physical, chemical, and environmental by which I mean physical is when things are knocked down, when things are changed. Here we've got some fairly extreme examples from the um, post-Reformation Civil War of things being hacked down for um, ideological, iconographic reasons. Then you've got bombings in the war. Then you've got the deterioration of the churches in the 17th, 18th century. So physically destroying the surfaces on which those um, paintings rest chemical changes. Um, walls are very aggressive places to put sensitive chemicals like some of the pigments. Now, people who knew what they were doing with, with wall paintings, uh, with the execution of wall paintings, tended to learn fairly quickly that some pigments survived, some didn't, and some changed chemically. Um, lead pigments and vermilion and mercuric sulfide, which is a very, very bright red, um, were particularly susceptible um, to the sort of chemical deterioration, especially in the damp north. You sometimes got away with it in Italy, though not always. Um, here you've got uh, uh, Little Wenham, which we've seen earlier um, on the right-hand side. And those faces would originally have been light pink, but the lead has chemically changed to make them um, black. Similar problem with Longthorpe Tower uh, near Peterborough. And just to show it's not all um, the Brits, there's a little bit of Pompeii over there where all of that yellow painting has changed into those red patches because of fire. Temperature changes pigments. So paintings change over time. Some of them are more durable and survive, some of them less so. And then thirdly, environment. All of the paintings that we look at, all of the buildings we look at, change and deteriorate because of the interaction between the moisture, the water vapor, the temperature, and the chemistry of what they're painted with. Now, those of you who look after paintings will be very familiar with salts or look after buildings uh, coming through. Salts causing crumbling of paint layers, crumbling of masonry, all sorts of um, damage. Um, churches are contaminated with salts. They're contaminated because of the original materials. People didn't wash their sand. They were full of this salt. Um, we all turn into salts. Every organic material buried in the ground which rots will turn into salt. So if you bury lots of people around a church, you will contaminate it with nitrates in this case. In the 19th century, there was a lot of industrial pollution. They introduced cement, all of which have salts in. So this contaminant material fills our churches, our church walls, and it's transported around by water. Water doesn't do much damage by itself, but if you dissolve salts in it, push it into a church wall where there's lots of nice little pores and it can crystallize at the surface and pop the surface off, cause it to crumble. Exactly these sorts of things that you're seeing on the screen happen. So water and salt is our enemy constantly with historic buildings, but wall paintings are really just the inner sensitive, beautiful skin of an historic building. They are not a separate entity like an easel painting. Environmental change is to do with how we breathe in our churches, how we heat our churches, how water penetrates through them. And I just put this example on of a 19th century um, chapel, lovely chapel at um, Paddington, St. Mary Magdalene. 
um, with some extremely finely decorated um, vaults, all of which are suffering, again, because of salt deterioration. Heating, we like to heat our churches. Our radiators change the temperature uh, of um, panels and walls. The temperature changes the humidity and all of a sudden either wooden structures start to move and split and paint layers move differently and flake off. Or again, we generate salt damage in our paintings. So how do we deal with this? Well, the first thing is to understand it. There is a very long history of conservation which involves fixing the symptoms, seeing something that's going wrong, gluing it back together, touching it up and going away again. Unless you tackle the underlying disease, all is lost. So the first thing we do is try and understand our buildings and see what's actually going wrong. Now, a lot of that is quite low tech. A lot of it, I, a lot of my time, I spend wandering around with a pencil and a um, pad of paper and a tape measure trying to work out drainage and why condensation is happening in certain places. It can be straightforward, but it is a matter of piecing that building together all the way through to your, your painting. So you understand the paint layer, the plaster layer, the brick substrate, how thick it is, how it goes to the outside, what condition it's in. It's piecing those elements together. And then occasionally, when it's complicated, it gets um, more tricky. You start to look at where the water is distributed in the building. You start to look at cold air leaking in here at Peterborough Cathedral under the doors, lots of cold air leaks in. The church on the bottom right has no insulation in the roof, so every time the sun comes out, the temperature changes massively. When it does that, the humidity changes, and all of those mechanical failure systems I talked about are suddenly triggered. Heating is a, is a big thing for us. Um, we tend to put in heaters where we want to be warm. We don't really think of where the heat is. Well, this is a, a vault in Canterbury Cathedral. Um, wonderful 13th century paintings on that vault. Most of the heat from that radiator is going up. It's not going out towards those pews. And so people and our needs of buildings these days have an enormous impact on the more sensitive elements of the fabric. We need to understand and control that. Sometimes we use very high-tech things like environmental monitoring, which I'm not going to go into now, but there's a whole range of, of tools out there, but they're all aimed at the same thing. Understand precisely what's going on. What's the painting actually made out of? What are those chemical pigments which are, are going black? Um, has it been retouched? Is the stuff we're looking at original? On the bottom right, all those dark swirls on that painting are retouching, which show up in ultraviolet light. Once we understand what's wrong, then we can start to properly look at fixing it, making it um, stable again and making it not happen again. Now, preventive conservation is probably the dullest um, term in conservation, but it's really what counts. And it does come down to good building management, good rainwater disposal systems, good pointing, good maintenance. They tend to, people tend to think of conservators as people like me in white coats turning up for five minutes and doing something. Um, actually, good conservation is done by the people who are in those churches day to day, year to year, generation to generation, looking after the building. That's what really counts. We only get involved when things go wrong. But when we do get involved, we're often uh, starting with stabilizing the structure itself. Um, We've heard about the plaster being the, the basis of the wall paintings. Of course, that's the structure on which they sit. If that is failing, if that's separating from the wall, delaminating, then the painting is lost. And then there's the paint layer itself, re-adhering that, making sure that that's not actually flaking away. Sometimes you need to introduce a, a very weak adhesive. Now, that adhesive has got to be sensitive to the material. It's got to be compatible, breathable, all of those things. But sometimes you actually do have to work flake by flake to re-adhere things, stabilize things. Sometimes you're discovering wall paintings. Everyone wants to discover wall paintings. It's very exciting. It's very slow. It's quite dangerous for the wall paintings and it's very expensive. So I often don't encourage it. But in so many of our churches, which appear to have white walls, there is a hidden treasure chest under those uh, white walls. 
I'm not suggesting for a moment you start uncovering those, but simply be aware. So when you are fixing things to the walls, of course, everyone's very good in using faculties, but were you to be fixing things to the walls, be aware that there is all this um, color and um, treasure hidden under those surfaces. Sometimes they're uncovered. Often we have to take off things that people put on before. Our predecessors used wax to solidify wall paintings. This was a disaster and has caused them to flake off. And so we have to spend a lot of time trying to take that off. Sometimes people just want to see the paintings better and to take off years of soot and dust. And then there's the question about retouching, reintegrating, representing. We tend to be reasonably conservative with this because it's very easy to see an over repainted um, painting. It looks new. So often we reintegrate, we tone down losses rather than repaint. Sometimes, however, that is recreation. Some colleagues of mine doing a recreation of a 1940s um, painting in Nottingham. Um, and there are, I'm not one of them, but there are some wonderful um, conservation artists out there who can recreate on a large scale. And finally, documentation. We spend an enormous amount of our time trying to understand what our predecessors did. What did they glue that back together with? Did they put anything in this wall? So now we try and document and record everything we do because we are only a very small part of a very long continuum. Someone will be back there in 25 years time, 250 if we're lucky, but someone will be back. So recording what we do is critical. Um, lastly, just some resources for those who are interested. Um, the Anticipating and Responding uh, to the Discovery of Wall Paintings document, um, Historic England, it's a few years old now, but it's still excellent. They've just re-released it. And for those who can't get enough of the technical side, the Building Environment um, volume of Practical Building Conservation. I think, Rachel, that's probably all for now. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Tobit. That was yeah, really fascinating. I really like the idea that um, just by looking, looking at the um, church buildings and how it's um, it's working and the drainage and that sort of thing, we can with our own churches locally do a lot to help these wall paintings survive. It's it's really nice to see. Um, Absolutely. I had got, like thinking about the um, sort of restoration techniques. Um, I had a question um, from my colleague actually. What do you think about the light, like light interpretations? For example, something that they've done in St Albans Cathedral recently was that they they shone projections on the um, partially uncovered wall paintings. Um, how do you feel about that? I think they are actually quite uh, a good tool if used um, properly. Um, one of the things with wall paintings, which is possibly a non-technical uh, element, is that making sure that people care about them, understand them, are aware of them, is probably more important in terms of their long-term conservation than any clever technical analysis. If people care about these things and get them, then they will look after them. Um, and so anything which helps with that uh, interpretation, uh, and as part of any good conservation project, there should be interpretive material, explanatory material. What, who painted them? What were they painted out of? What do they mean? Now, there is a lot of projection going on at the moment. It is quite a popular newish tool. Now, LED projectors can, can handle big buildings in the light. Um, the difficulty is the image. If you're projecting an image, you need to have made up that image. So you need someone who's actually competent in understanding what a medieval painting looks like, understands the iconography, understands what that image is that they are um, making to project. So in principle, it's fine. I'm often asked, um, is there a risk projecting over mm -hmm. existing paintings? Occasionally, but rarely. If you have highly photosensitive uh, paintings, which are chemically sensitive to light paintings, potentially you could cause a problem. But on the whole, wall paintings aren't sensitive, uh, highly photosensitive because they wouldn't have survived in the first place. So it's a theoretical risk, but really an actual one. Um, my issue tends to be with the accuracy or the usefulness of the image. Do it well, yeah, it can be great. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, I'm going to hand over now to John Morrison. John, you're going to tell us about your wall paintings um, in your church in Arundel. Um, and a bit, you've had a conservation project going on there, haven't you? We have, yes. <clears throat> We've been doing conservation work for 10 years, so this is one of a series, but it's a very exciting one. Um, so I'm just going to share some images. Uh, if you could give me a moment. Right, is that clear or not yet? Right, can you hear me and can you see it? Because I can't yes, hear you. Yes, you're enough. perfect, John. We can hear I, and see you. Okay, and you can see what the uh, correct image now, can you? A view yes. over Arundel? Well, a view over Arundel, it's perfect. Okay, good. Right, um, so um, this is a drone image uh, in the northeast corner the drone was located. So immediately behind the camera is a castle, Arundel Castle. And the building that you're looking at is the building we're talking about. Um, which is a church that was constructed by the fourth Fitzalan Earl of Arundel uh, with the uh, education in 1380. So it was built just a few years after 1380. Uh, there was a Norman church before here and there's probably an Anglo-Saxon church before that. Um, when this was built in 1380, the Earl was following through the will of his father. And uh, what was important was to establish a college and uh, the college was located in what you could have thought would be the chancel of the church. But this, from 1318 onwards, immediately became a college, so the College of the Holy Trinity, Our Lady and all the saints. And the parish church then is the transept areas and the nave area and the tower. Now, a lot has happened in this chancel area, what's became a college, and then became a chapel. But that's not part of the wall painting story, so I'm not going to tell that particular story. Um, we're located in Arundel Castle grounds, or this part, or this drone is located just on the boundary of it, and the churchyard just forms a small part of that. And uh, up to the uh, 1800s, the paths around the church were on this side, the north side of the building. Now, many people know Arundel Church, and they would know that you come from the south side. And uh, what happened in the early 1800s was the Duke, by then the Duke of Norfolk, uh, had the road closed and built a new road so the entrances were to the south. But the medieval routes into the church were all on the north side. So it's a wonderful building. There's got lots of other wonderful buildings around it. But I'm talking about wall paintings in the part, which is the tower, the transept, and then the nave, or just a small part of that. So if we move on, another drone. Image. This one was about a year ago, or two years ago, sorry. And what uh, the issue is, we've had a awful lot of problem over this decade with water penetration and it's caused damage and it's very upsetting and we're largely largely through dealing with it but this north aisle roof has completely failed and so water's penetrating particularly at the lower edge uh, the south aisle roof is not much better but this one's in a terrible state and the wall paintings i want to talk about are located around this north porch door and in the gap between these windows so the medieval church, you entered from the north side. This path looks to be a very old path. You would go in through the church at this, into the church at this point. And these wall paintings, two of them, are what you saw as you were leaving the church. Um, so the roof needs replacing, and that's got to be done properly. But we've also got three species of bats that live inside the church, and uh, they've also got to be protected. So we've got pipistrelle, long-eared brown bats, and the serotine bats. The serotine bats is maybe just one or two, um, but they arrive in April and they stay until October. And so what it really means is you can't do a lot of work in the church between April and October. You have to do the work during the winter months. But this then is the chapel, which is not part of the church, the Fitzalan Chapel. Uh, the bats fly freely in that part of the church, uh, but that's not what my responsibility is and it's not what I'm talking about. But if you go around the church, there are bat roosts all the way round, right? Uh, the different species or the species being in the same place. So the main maternity roost has always been there and there on the north side of the church. Uh, but there's another one here on the south side. 
In fact, the bats seem to be setting themselves up quite well here as well. And then the serotonin bat or bats has located itself immediately above what we use as the altar, well, where the altar space is. So uh, lots of evidence of bats, lots of bats flying around. But we have to, uh, doing restoration work, we can't do it when the bats are there. Um, I think perhaps we're fortunate that they come for the summer and then go, right? Because otherwise I don't know when we do any work. Um, so that is the bats that we need to be taking notice of. Now I'm sure you're keen to see the wall paintings, but I'm going to digress even a little bit more and go and look at another church, which has got nothing at all to do with St. Nicholas, uh, which is St. George's Church at Trotton. And at St. George's Church, then on this west wall, they have uh, a number of wall paintings, but two of those, uh, so one is the Seven Deadly Sins and one is the Seven Virtues. It was exposed early in the 1900s and described. Um, and I'm showing it because it actually betrays some of the images that are in St. Nicholas, but you can't, you wouldn't think so from what you can see at St. Nicholas. So over here, we've got the door that comes in at the West End, but we've got a good person. And the good person is surrounded by the seven virtues that you're expected to follow. And six of those virtues are described in St. Matthew's Gospel. I'll talk about that in a second more. But the seventh has been added on as well as being an important virtue. On the other side of the door, you've got an evil person. And the evil person has got dragons emerging from the body. And in the mouth of each dragon is depicted a scene, like one of the sins that you have definitely got to avoid. Uh, all those, so those are the two, two of the three wall paintings at St. Nicholas, but these are much, much clearer and uh, much more in, well, easy to, to see than the St. Nicholas ones. The rest is not part of St. Nicholas. Um, Tommy mentioned uh, interpretation, and so there's a variety of things at Trotton where they're interpreting their church, but to say it's a good person. And from Matthew uh, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, then it is making it very, very clear that it's important that you care for prisoners, you tend the sick, you feed the hungry, you clothe the naked, you give drink to the thirsty, you welcome strangers. And the one that's not part of that parable is you bury the dead. Right? On the other side, you've got the evil person and the sins are envy, anger, lust, pride, gluttony, sloth and avarice. And the interpretation of the St. Nicholas one is that what you're able to see is the head of the evil person, but you're also able to see avarice in the mouth of the dragon. So you're getting close to seeing the wall paintings, but we just go once more inside the church. And this is the church in 1860. Um, looking to the east, uh, the pews are all very different, the church layout's very different. But the reason I'm showing the slide is because in the early part of the 19th century, galleries were built down the sides of the church. On the south side, you can just see one poking out here, but all along the north side of the church. And it's when those galleries were being put in that people noticed there were two wall paintings there. The third one was noticed when the gallery was taken out. Um, and the gallery, in fact, has done damage to the wall painting um, and attempts to restore the wall paintings since that time, since the 1860s, uh, hasn't done them any favours. So, to see the wall paintings, then you're now inside the church, and this is back last October, and you're looking into the northwest corner of the church, and you've got the one wall painting here, which is the coronation of the Virgin, and you've got a wall painting here, which are the seven virtues, and alongside it, and overlapping it really, are the seven sins. And then you've got the north porch, which would be your exit point from the church. So um, our project then was to replace the roof because water ingress on that wall is doing damage, considerable amount of damage, uh, not to interfere with the bats, but also to collect up information about the heritage of the church. And that's been fascinating and enjoyable. And the wall paintings were a key part of that. So this is at the start of the actual project. So the coronation of the virtue in the topic was actually highlighting a number of things that, is, that have been done to it. Uh, it's been coated in wax. Uh, the lines could well have been overlaid. I was interested in Tobit talking about what might cause that dark colour because something certainly interfered with the colour that was there before. 
Um, the uh, Victorian's gallery had a pillar stuck right in the middle of it. So that didn't do any good at all, really. So that then is uh, early 15th century wall painting. And uh, we've been, as well as working with the ecologists for the bats, then we've been working with a conservator called Tom Organ, who has assessed our wall paintings and looked at the needs, been very, very clear about the advice. And certainly from 2012 onwards, we've been working towards to try to stabilize them because some bits of the paint and plaster are detaching itself. Uh, but it's a step-by-step -step process. So that's the Coronation Virgin. Now, the other two look like that, right? So if you were looking to interpret that, that's not easy, right? That's the view from the ground. Uh, if we start over here and we've got a memorial stone, the Victorians put there, it's now been moved lower down. Um, there are four visible scenes. So we'll start trying to sort of interpret them now, but we get a lot closer. So we've got here, uh, a scene which is visiting the sick, burying the dead, clothing the naked and feeding the hungry. There's a wheel, so it's a circular sort of wagon wheel with spokes going in it and there's an angel standing in the middle. Over here you've got we've got the seven deadly sins but all we can really see from the ground is the head of the evil man which is here and a dragon's mouth and in the dragon's mouth we've got avarice or we're saying it's avarice. All the rest of it, you've got lots of evidence of people trying to do things to the wall paintings at various times that haven't done them a great deal of good. So uh, to get the closer look at the seven sins, the two elements that we can actually see. So say we've got the head of the evil man and there's bits of a dragon on top of the head. And then we've got avarice in the mouth of the dragon. And uh, one of the issues with the wall paintings is that the lime wash that's been applied over the years and none has been applied for several decades is not the right base color. So the base color of the wall paintings is not the base color that's been used for the lime wash. So that was another issue that was going to need um, to, to be um, resolved. Of the seven virtues, this is getting much closer to looking at the scenes that can be deciphered. So you've got the sick person's head there, looking quite poorly and somebody providing comfort. Uh, the burying of the dead is the clearest one. And so you've got the body to be interred, you've got holy water being sprinkled over the body and a number of people being involved in the burial. Over here, you've got a person standing, uh, presumably holding some clothes because standing in front of them, you've got a view from the back of a naked person uh, waiting to be clothed. And then up here, you've got a number of people being fed. They're sat at a table, uh, ready to be supported. So those are the elements of the, uh, the actual wall painting that we've got. Now, uh, the carrying out the work then, which has been going on since October, is that we had to replace the roof. Right? We were very, very worried about the wall paintings and the fact that while the work was going on during the winter, there was a great risk that the water damage was going to increase and so the decision was made is that we would have to put a temporary roof over the roof and we've had an awful winter we've had a lot of damage done at the west end of the church and it's exactly right to put that roof over the roof but then it does cost an awful lot more money um, inside the church we've got the internal scaffolding which is going up which allowed the conservator to stabilize the wall paintings because I said there was plaster that was detached uh, well it was covered up while the, the work was going on over the top of it. Um, over here we've got Tom Organ working away on the head of the evil man but there were several areas that had to be worked upon and because the sort of care of the bats was quite a, a prime task then this is the ecologist on one of a number of visits putting an endoscope up underneath the timbers, just making sure the bats had actually gone. And you know, the, project, the project's gone well. The, um, having the temporary roof, then we could well have had major disasters if we hadn't put it there. But one thing that we hadn't realized, um, hadn't even guessed could possibly happen, was that when Tom was doing the visits and doing the checks on the humidity, it was clear that the wall had dried out quite considerably. And so a decision was made 
that if we could raise additional funds, it was a good time to apply the correct colour of lime wash over the entire wall. Because otherwise we're going to have to spend something like £20,000 putting scaffolding back up again in a few years time, hopefully no later than that, to do that repair work. So uh, the funds were raised for that work to actually take place. So just before lockdown, we had uh, pretty well finished, including giving the wall, apart from where the wall paintings are, three coats of lime wash. Uh, lockdown meant it all then had to stop. Um, our contractors have been able to come back in the last week or two. So that north wall that we looked at to start with is now looking like this, right? It's still got bits of builders debris down the bottom here. Um, but the uh, wall paintings are there and safe. The lime wash is the correct colour. So if we look over here at the head of the evil man, we can see that colour here. It's my, they're my pictures and so the light's not quite right. But one of the checks was to clean a very small part of the wall painting to establish the right mix for the lime plaster. And that's been done. So the wall is the eye colour, apart from other areas that were checked, uh, the eyelid of the evil man, right? And the same for Avarice, all being ready with the correct colour. So uh, the roof has been replaced. So rather than those large sheets of lead, it's now got a step in it. Um, all the old lead has come back with more added and it's smaller sections, so it shouldn't have this expansion problem, which is linked to why it was starting to crack and leak. And Virtually all of it was done by, uh, by hand and tapping, you know, minimal use of heat. So we've got some very complicated joints joining the various sheets, but uh, it's certainly hopefully that the roof is not going to need looking at for some considerable amount of time. Um, the bats are back, so they're happy as well. Um, and uh, it's just a question of tidying up. But the combination of having to have the ecologist give you advice, the wall painting consultant give you advice, the architect to understand what's actually going on. We, you know, we would have loved to have done this work years ago, um, but we've been doing a lot of other work. So I didn't talk about the chapel, the college. I didn't talk about the Arundel Choir book, uh, which is fascinating. I didn't talk about the corbels where we've got a green man uh, and lots of other figures. I didn't talk about the Mason's marks and how they're all through the church, along with an awful lot of medieval graffiti, uh, some of which is associated with pilgrimage but uh, I hope that was helpful. Okay. That was great, thank you, John. It looks, yeah, it looks like it is a really, um, lots of strands to your project to manage. Um, yeah, and everything coming together, but it's yeah. really nice how everything that you've talked about has picked up on um, what yeah. Tobit and Roger were also saying. Through, I thought, no, I think we're okay. We're just about the things that we were supposed to do. Oh yeah, certainly. Well, I've got a couple of questions now, and we've got a few minutes to um, work through those. So if I put everybody together and unmute you. Um, so the, fir the first thing really that I, I, want, to, I want to ask um, was about how, how do you, when you approach a wall painting, um, how do you go about working out what it is depicting? Um, I wonder if this is one more for Roger. Um, so are there any helpful guides perhaps out there? Well, buy my book. <laughs> As a comprehensive uh, gazetteer, there's two books which have gazetteers in them, which will give you a pretty good idea of what you're looking at. As I said earlier, the key is that there are a limited number of subjects. We don't look at a wall painting and think it could be anything. You know, without being absurdly reductionist, it is going to show generally, apart from the decorative schemes that I mentioned earlier, they are going to show images of Christ, the Virgin Mary, a key saints, particularly St. Christopher, a large figure often found on the South Wall. They're going to show some Bible stories, but they're going normally to be limited to Genesis and to the infancy and passion of Christ. And then there are going to be a doom above the Chancellor Arts. There are going to be three living and the three dead, the image of the angel, uh, the weighing of souls. And then you move on to, as you've seen with John, you, you, if you, there are a number of ways in which the seven 
deadly sins and virtues can be shown. These are not formulaic, they're not fixed. So John has the seven uh, deadly sins and the seven virtues shown within a wheel. But as you saw at St. George's in Trotton, the other example that John gave, there's a standing figure. Uh, the good man is surrounded by individual scenes of the seven works of mercy. And on the other hand, the evil figure had uh, uh, dragons coming from the body to show the paternity, the demotic paternity of the sins. And then you have at the end, there's a more, less common, the warning of, to janglers or don't talk in church, don't chatter in church, don't make a noise, don't be respectful. Those blasphemy scenes, the figure of, so what I'm trying to say, there are, there's a lot, the subjects can't be anything. They tend to be, there are going to be exceptions to every rule, so don't, don't say I know something different because you do know something different. There was always going to be an exception, but in general, uh, the, the subjects are going to be confined to what I've been saying, and therefore, with a bit of practice, you can work out what they are. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, and the the ones that I always pick out that are very um, clear are often uh, Saint Christopher by the by the doorway <laughs> on the way in and out. Now we've had we've had lots of questions about. Um, uh, looking after wall paintings. So a, a lot more in Tobit's ballpark, maybe. Um, there's a couple related specifically to bats. Um, so one uh, about um, the physical damage that bats could cause. So uh, do you notice that bats brushing against wall paintings might um, have some negative effects? Um. Bats are pretty good at flying. They don't tend to bump into things terribly uh, often. Um, and so unless you're actually on the, the um, egress path for, for a bat roost, you, the, the physical impact is, is few and far between. The, the issue throughout is bat excreta, uh, which is highly corrosive, um, also highly toxic. So in terms of environmental health, it's a major issue as well. Um, and so that's where the damage is 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 linked in. It's it's extremely uh, hitting the paintings often also on that on that route out because everything tends to be focused in a rather unpleasant way on that section. Um, but but um, bats defecate in flight, so you can actually see the bat patterns around the church where they uh, they go. If one is concerned about it, it's that rather than the physical damage, unless there are really big bats somewhere that I don't know about. And I suppose to remove the bat droppings from a medieval wall painting would definitely be a time to call in a conservator rather than tackle it yourself. It's not on the surface, that's the trouble. Your, uh, I mean, bat urine just soaks in, obviously. Um, bat crap just sits on the surface and then the chemicals soak in. So removing the visible um, chunk of material is well two problems with it first of all if you take it off you probably take a chunk of the painting off with it because it's stuck to it the second thing is if you do were to manage to take it off without any sort of damage the the damaging chemicals have soaked in um, and that's where the the issue tends to be more so with chemically sensitive pigments than with some of the more robust um, limes and ochres and things like that um, but it's the same general risk throughout. Okay, thank you so much. That's um, really clear actually. Um, because when while you can see it, you think that it must be very much causing damage there. But um, in well, reality, the damage may already be done. But. Exactly. The damage, the damage happens at and immediately after impact. Once, once that chemical reaction is going on, the damage is happening. The, 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 the evidence which is sitting there is often not actually the major risk. As I say, from a chemical point of view, from a health and safety point of view, from breathing in dust from, from excretion things, that's a different story entirely. That's, that's a much longer term thing. Yes, perhaps we'll touch on that a little bit more next week on our batty focused um, webinar. Now, you, I think, Toby, you mentioned about more wall paintings being underneath the, the surface. Um, John, have you any idea of how many wall paintings are left under the the, um, the plaster, or I, I, is it a mystery? 
No, it's not a mystery. It's uh, in terms of fragments of wallpaper, not wallpaper, not wallpaper, wall paintings. Uh, they are all around the church. So uh, the conservator then has examined all the walls uh, and is able to point out where the where you can actually see paint. So I think the point about putting anything on a wall, you are likely to be doing some damage in the same way as you could see at St Nicholas with the uh, Victorian memorial stones being put on a wall. It does cause mm -hmm. damage. But uh, you know, just in terms of trying to find a way of protecting the ones which are visible, then I can't believe anyone would want to start uncovering it uh, unless you absolutely had to really. You know, and, the, and the lime, probably could correct me, but I think the lime wash is not doing it any more harm by having the lime wash on top of it, so it's best to leave it alone. Yeah, I, I would generally agree. I mean, one mm. the, the damage with lime wash, if you like, occurs when it's applied. Uh, so if you have a powdery painting and you apply a lime wash uh, covering on the surface, of course it penetrates in, but it sits there. Uh, if you then try and take it off, you have to do that with immense dexterity and care. And even then it can be quite damaging and it is time consuming and expensive. So if it's sitting tucked up and stable, and it's recorded so no one does anything otherwise damaging then it's that's that's often the the best advice for cash trap parishes yeah brilliant okay um I, well i think that's more or less all we've got time for today i just want to quickly go back and say very briefly um about the health and safety concerns around bat droppings and urine um, if you have bat droppings and urine in your church, don't uh, worry, they don't co contain diseases or anything like that. Um, there's, it's dusty and there are some, uh, it, well, it's advisable to wear a mask, but um, yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not the worst thing in the world and there are no diseases like you would get in bat, uh, bird droppings, for example. Um, but we will cover more on the, um, on a dedicated, uh, bats in churches session next week and we will focus on um, the challenges that churches face and, and what we in the project are doing to um, to address to address some of those um, and if there are any questions left today that I have not answered we will try and get back to you via Facebook or Twitter and um, do get in touch via our website as well which is batsinchurches.org there's a contact page on there so if you have any specific questions for any of our, our panelists today um, they promised that we, I can come back to them and ask them questions and they'll they'll um, <laughs> they'll reply I hope um, so after this webinar finishes there should be a, a screen that magically appears with a short link to a questionnaire a survey for us and it's it's only three questions long and it would be really helpful if you could fill that out um, a link will come through via email as well if you miss it um, well, all that remains to be said is a huge thank you to our guests today, Roger, Tobit and John. They have been fantastic speakers and it's been really fascinating to find out um, a little bit more about wall paintings. Um, and I can't wait to get back out to some of our churches and look at them in person again, which will be wonderful. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience and thank you for all your questions. Goodbye. Bye-bye.